The Feynman Lectures on the Character of Physical Law, Part 4. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the very dry Edwards Plateau. Dry and crunchy. Dusty yes. bones are very dusty. We need some rain down here. I mean, we've been getting a little bit, but it's just not like we normally do. I mean, we missed all of the spring storms. Yeah. Right. I feel like we normally in the spring we get thunderstorms and Yeah, we've only had like three point two inches all year. Yeah. So at the vineyard where the weather station is. Right. So it's been very dry. Yeah. And uh we uh <clears throat> it's been so dry that the creek stopped running. Turtle Creek. Oh uh, yes. And the there's two reservoirs, there's there's two dams on the property. And uh, they were basically dry. The water stopped flowing over the dam, both dams. and Which that has, I mean, that's happened occasionally. It'll stop, but they've never dried up like this yeah, before. Yeah, this is dried up. In other words, there's water's not even touching the dam. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's basically these big still ponds, puddles. Right. Yep. And there's so much silt in there from 50 years or whatever of uh, alluvium. So we... Uh, Made the decision, well, not us, but our boss made the decision like, okay, we're going to we're gonna dredge these out. And the neighbor across the way, right? They're yeah. kind of... We have a new neighbor who bought the place across the creek, and he's like, let's dredge this out. Yeah. So it's like, all right, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, we pulled the plug on the dams, and I dug a trench... To let the rest through of the, the sediment water yeah. to the sediment to the place where the water was standing, and we were prepared with a giant um, harvest bin full of water with bubblers in it <laughs> and nets. And when the water was draining out, we were netting up all these huge fish, dude. And I i mean, we pulled out some catfish, the biggest cats I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I mean, one of them uh, took two of us to pick it up and throw it in that harvest bin. It was, it was, it had to be like, I don't know, 40 or 50 pounds. This thing was massive. God. <laughs> and we pulled like four of those out. The The biggest one was the one I just mentioned, but the other three were still huge fish. And it, like it ripped one of the nets. So the, the two, our two coworkers like had these two five gallon buckets and they got one over the fish's head <laughs> and the other guy got the other bucket over his tail and they were like <laughs> dragging him through the mud, picked him up and, Oh my gosh, it was just crazy. Giant bass. So we loaded all these fish in this tank and then we took them to our back pond, which is, which is, um, we can fill it with the well. That's the pond that, that waters the hillside vineyard. Yeah. So it's a pretty nice pond and we dumped all these. I mean, there's hundreds of fish in that pond now because they pulled hundreds of fish out of the upper reservoir the first couple of days. Right. Yeah. And then we just did the lower reservoir. Is there like a, some kind of, uh, Survival of the fishiest going on in there right now. <laughs> we tried to ca- we tried to catch a whole bunch of the, the the perch and the minnows and stuff and throw them in there too. Yeah. So hopefully, and then we're gonna get a, we're gonna provide supplemental feed in that pond. Yeah, we got. But feed there's them. like there's a giant. You know, the frogs were just living it up in that pond. They're like, we own this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Nope. <laughs> so <laughs> now there's some monsters in there. <laughs> there are some monsters in there. It was it was a it was just mind blowing. It's crazy and because you, people fish in there, and you know they're catching little things or whatever, and then like you drain it, and there are these enormous yeah, monsters in living mud. in the mud, in like, the mud at the bottom. We're sludging through the mud, and we're looking for fish and stuff, and it's like okay, the, you know the water's maybe a foot deep. Yeah, there's a couple of places where the water's kind of deep, but mostly you're just walking in this thick mud. Right, and we're not seeing the fish, and finally we're like, okay, well let's let's call it a day. And I, so I drove the excavator through the deepest part of the water, which is 
you know, not even deep enough to go over the mini excavator track, like right, up, yeah. up into the body of the mini excavator. So it's anyway, I, I, I dropped the blade down a little bit and just like push some of this mud. And it's, it's literally like at the consistency of, um, like pudding. Yeah. Pudding. Yeah. So it's not mounding up in front of the do uh, yeah. of, the, of the blade. It's just sort of, right. you know, out in front. And I guess they had cubby holes down in that mud because that's when the giant fish just came out of the woodwork and they were like, they <laughs> were just themselves. beaching them. Yeah. And we were like, oh, you know, running down there, grabbing these fish. Man, what a day. It was, it was 13 hours. That just hours. made me, it you know, you were telling me all that and that just made me think about the ocean. You know, they're like this... Like, yeah, do yeah. we really have any no, idea? We have we have no idea what's how happening. big there are stuff. You know, <laughs> some of that stuff is down there. Like, it, you think you you figured it all out? There's a school of fish here. There's that thing over there. But no, man, there's monsters down yeah. there. You you haven't been down into that cave at the bottom of the Mariana's right. Trench. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you, know, yeah. it's, you haven't seen the it's worm. It's not a cave. It's just to the mouth. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. So that's. We, we saved as many fish as we could, and, you know, you can't save them all. So it was still kind of like, ah. But the cool thing is, is that we did dredge the upper reservoir a couple of years back as best as we could with some small machines. Yeah. And it made it deeper. It was completely choked with lily pads and mud and boulders and all this stuff. <clears throat> and when we did that, we threw all those fish downstream That's over the right. dam into the lower reservoir. Yeah. So I was thinking for the past couple of years, I'm like, that that upper reservoir didn't have good fish in it. You know? Right. Well, it did. It yeah. had monsters in there and they were <laughs> flourishing. So it's like, I was just thinking maybe when we dredged it out, it just, there was a lot more room and they flourished up there. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping that when we dig this out, because down, down at the lower dam, it's probably, it's probably eight feet deep. Yeah. But really, it's been it knee could, deep. It could be eight feet deep if we dig, dug it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's been knee deep. Yes. For a long time. So yeah. it should be a much better place. And like once once we get it cleaned out and then we can move all those fish back. Once we get it cleaned out and we get some water, some rain. Yeah. And yeah. it fills it back up. Yeah. Well, we won't move all the fish, but we probably will move a bunch of fish back. Yeah. How are you going to catch them? Well. Just, just pump all the water out of that. Upper the the pond upper pond <laughs> the upper pond needs some maintenance too. Okay, right? it's, yeah, it's a little leaky up on the dam, so we were thinking, well, we could let it kind of dry up in the winter. Ah, so once we get water, yeah, we can, uh, you know, maybe we can go in there and net some fish and move them. But I don't know, I don't know what we're gonna do. We'll yeah. figure it out, weather permitting. Yeah, well, there you go. That's your agricultural update. <laughs> Always something weird. <laughs> it's never a dull moment. <laughs> <laughs> what about rock and roll? We can tell them, I mean, what we're just practicing. Yeah, we've just been jamming. Yeah. Um, we're working on learning how to play the album, like, live. Yeah, and, you know, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's an acoustic show, yep. which would be, would still be plugged in, but we're playing acoustic guitars, Um you know, not not like a big drum set, but using more of the percussion, the djembe. Um, so it's kind of like a smaller deal. And then there's the full electric show. And so we've, we've been working on multiple different things. But yeah, we're going to be booking dates to go do those cave sessions. So Russ and I have been jamming. Yeah. Uh, I just went up to Austin yesterday and jammed out with uh, Archer. Yep. So, yeah, just, you know. Shedding it. <laughs> Wood shedding it. Wood shedding it. Yeah. All right. Um, Excellent. There you go. Rock and roll update. Let's do Space Weather. <laughs> From spaceweather.com. Geomagnetic storm watch. A minor G1 class geomagnetic storm is possible on July 20th and 21st when a slow moving CME is expected to hit Earth's magnetic field. This CME was hurled into space by an unstable filament of magnetism, which erupted on July 15th. Also, there was a huge solar prominence. There is a prominence jutting out from the sun's southwestern limb today. It is so big that astronomers were struggling to squeeze it into a single photograph. They had to mosaic six exposures to capture the entire thing. 
Uh, they inserted an image of Earth for scale. So the wall, this wall of plasma is more than five times taller than our entire planet. Wow. Structures like this, in which scorching hot plasma is held very high by dynamic magnetic fields, are inherently unstable. If this prominence erupts in the next couple of days, amateur astronomers will get a fantastic side-on view of its disintegration. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to look at that and think that, you know, we, we see like, like we see volcanic plumes here and they appear to just tower up into the atmosphere. But this is a plume that's coming off the surface of the sun that goes five times higher than the, our entire planet. That's insane. It's wild. And the gravity well and that it's in is so ridiculously strong. Yes, and, so and throwing that stuff. Oh. <laughs> but relative to the body it's on, it's just a small little plume, just like a volcano here. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just the scales are crazy. And then, of course, our sun is a little bitty dot compared to some of the stars that are out there in yeah, space. It's wild. Yeah. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 413.0 kilometers per second, and the density is a very low 0.62 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 153. Neutron count is only 2.9% above the space age average. Um, uh, KP index is 2, which is quiet, and the 24-hour max was also 2. Cool. Do you remember, um, I don't know, it was probably a couple of years ago where I was talking about what if we are in a black hole? Oh, yeah. You remember this? Yeah. We were talking about redshift and all this. Yeah. Everything looks like it's hauling ass away from us. And Yep. So Archer showed me a video the other night of this physicist who was basically explaining that that's what he thinks is going on. Oh, really? Yeah. And he's, of <laughs> yeah. course, he's got all the, like, mm -hmm. really good information to back it up. So he sent me that link. We should watch it. Oh, okay. Um, but, yeah, for some reason, I just remembered that. It's... Uh, just, I, I'm just thinking about the pulsars and stuff, you know, that are... Oh, yeah. It's just all this weird stuff that's happening out there that we're like, oh, my God, what is the deal? Yeah. Like, how, how, and dark matter and dark energy and how much of this could be explained by the fact that we are in... Some kind of... a black hole. Uh, yeah, a singularity. Yeah, I mean, I've... Uh, I've read some old science fiction that talked about the possibility of living within, with it, like if you, if everything was done correctly, you could orbit just inside the, uh, uh, the radius, the Schwarzkopf, Schwarz, Schwarz, Schwarz Kyle, child radius. Schwarzschild? <laughs> I don't know. Schwarzkopf, Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, you know, just, just below the area where it's, uh, the, that the, uh, strength of gravity is just higher than the speed of light. Mm. Then it would basically shut off, shut you off from the rest of the universe, you know. Yeah, so I think this guy's idea is that the entire observable universe is, is inside is, it. Is in one, yeah, yeah. Which is why there's that horizon out there that... Right. So it, it explains, because the closer you are, like, in, right, you're, that would basically sh uh, explain the expansion... The dark energy thing. Yep. Everything. The further away everything is, the further you're separating from it. Right. The faster you're yes. separating from it. And then the horizon out there where just light can't even, that's outside. Yeah. 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 That's the edge of the radius. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. So the whole observable universe is in one. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where he's going. We didn't watch the whole thing. It's an hour long and it was like six in the morning. No. Oh, okay. And we were like, uh. <laughs> We're still up <laughs> drinking beers. <laughs> like, let's go to bed. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, crypto. Bitcoin is $20,828.87, and Ethereum is $1,345.60. Everything, mar market is still down. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting until it's too late to get in. <laughs> You're procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find the, I'll find the link in the in the break. Oh, I have I have another thing. I um, for that that uh, black hole thing. It's been long enough now that I guess it's it's real, so I can talk about it on the podcast. But I quit cigarettes like I guess about a month ago. So just Bravo, just what? to explain what the if you're if you're hearing this, <laughs> that's in the breathing that's, into the oxygen that's, tank. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's basically me dying. <laughs> <laughs> From lack of smokes. 
I guess we're going to have to change it to beers, vapes, and rock and roll. <laughs> beers, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so I switched to this vape pen, and I, that's what I've been using for the past month. I haven't had a cigarette in, uh, in like, four weeks. So Good job, man. How, how's it feel now? Is it, like, are you still just like, damn it? Yeah. <laughs> really? You no, know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, it's a, like, I was just thinking about how to describe it, and it's, it's about getting into the habit of being out of the habit. Mm. That's what it is for me. I have all of these things that I do yeah, yeah. in which habitually I'm reaching for the smokes. And so I sit Just down to do that thing. everywhere. Mousetraps. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. I'll retrain your habits real quick. <laughs> Well, the habit is just, it occurs in my brain. Yeah. And then I'm like, but I don't have any, so I reach for the vape. So I've been wondering if this is, like, extending the problem. Oh, yeah, I've wondered that, too. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, I, would, I would, the, to... would, the, would the problem, this, you know, that inclination be gone if I didn't have the vape because I still reach for something and I still take yeah, a pull yeah. on something? But whatever, you know, it's working. Um, it isn't that bad. It's just annoying sometimes. Yeah. yeah I, when I switched, switched to the vape, uh, I even like, I started just like, you know, blazing this thing nonstop. And so then I was like, okay, I need to chill out. And then I, <laughs> I moved to like the lower nicotine level, Yeah. which kind of helped me like get, you know, it's just, you just don't crave it as, as hard. Like, I guess you're getting less nicotine. Yeah. I don't know. So I, I really had to try to make myself like not pick it up constantly mm. but yeah i don't know it doesn't feel like a craving for nicotine it's just like there are these there are these habits that are built in but maybe it is i don't know i can't really identify what the what it is what it is but i i'll be doing whatever it is like reading or you know whatever and like where i would normally light up a smoke and then that's when it occurs to me and then that was that, that reminds me that i don't have a smoke yeah yeah you know and then i and, and that's I, what makes you even need a smoke yeah <laughs> and then it's i stressful and I, yeah and i'm like god damn it and then i pick up the vape and i take a couple of hit and then i forget and i put it down yeah, yeah. and i do keep doing whatever <laughs> it was i was doing so i was just wondering if like because for the for most of the time i've for i i'm not aware you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and the longer you can go where you're not aware that you quit smoking, the better. Yeah. That's how I look at it. It's the same way I deal with the back pain, right? I have an injured back and there's this, there's this like response thing where it's like the longer you can go without being aware that your back hurts, the better you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the longer you can go without being aware and being reminded like, oh yeah, I quit cigarettes. Damn it. You know, so I was joking with people when I first did this that like every morning I woke up and I was like, oh, yeah, fuck, <laughs> you know, make the coffee and then you want the smoke and you're like, oh, yeah, I quit that. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's not too bad. It's really not too bad. But yeah, that's I just good. wanted to let because people have asked, like, what is that hissing noise? And that's me <laughs> it's, it's turning into a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just don't talk with it in there because then you're <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right, you got stories. I've got a story. I do. Uh, what is your story on the moon? My story is on the moon. Start there. Okay, and then we'll move into deeper. Space. So this is not new. This is from June twenty fourth. Um, some some people probably heard of this, but this is I did get this from NASA.gov, so it's totally trustworthy. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spots rocket impact site on the moon. So astronomers discovered a rocket body headed towards a lunar collision late last year. So they, they detected it at the end of 2021. And the impact occurred on March 4th with NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter later spotting the resulting crater. And surprisingly, the crater is actually two craters. There's an eastern one and a western one. The eastern one is superimposed upon the western crater. They're both about the same size. One's 18 meters or 19.5 yards, and the other one is 16 meters or 17.5 yards. This double crater was unexpected and may indicate that the rocket body had large masses at each end. Typically, a spent rocket has mass concentrated at the motor end. The rest of the rocket stage mainly consists of an empty fuel tank. 
Since the origin of the rocket body remains uncertain, the double nature of the crater may indicate its identity. Hmm. No other rocket body impacts on the moon created double craters. The four Apollo uh, SIVB craters were somewhat irregular in outline. These were from Apollos 13, 14, 15, and 17. And they were substantially larger, greater than 35 meters, or around 38 yards. Um, the maximum width... 29 meters or 31.7 yards of the double crater of the mystery rocket was near that of the SIVBs. So that's the combined width of the two craters. LRO, or Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, is managed by NASA's Goddard F Space Flight Center in Greenbelt in Maryland for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington. Uh, okay, this is just a thing for the LRO. So anyway, that's I guess that's the end of the story. They got a couple of pictures here of the craters that does look like a double impact. I thought people were saying it was like a Chinese rocket or something. Well, I mean, the, the, the reason why it's unknown is because uh, just no one has claimed yeah. credit for the rocket. And then... It, so that makes Strange. it a mystery, but no one is, ex you know, no one is thinking that it's something weirder than it's just somebody's some other yeah. nation's rocket that we don't know about um i mean i guess some people are it was aliens i don't know but the point is is that somebody crashed a rocket into the moon or lost control of a rocket or something <coughs> but no one has claimed credit none of the western nations and you know so maybe it was a chinese thing doesn't i'm not sure but the other mystery about it is why it made two impacts yeah did it break up before it hit and two two distinct pieces impacted, and they must have been close to the same mass, right? To and, make the same size, curve. right? And that's so that's why it's interesting. Is like normally you have a mostly empty tank and then mm -hmm. a big, heavy, massy engine at one end. Yeah. So if the tank came off and then the engine hits, it would make a big crater, and the tank would make a little, little bitty thing. But this one has two almost the same size, so that makes it interesting. Did it have some kind of payload hmm. that was massive? That's strange. Yeah. And maybe there's updates. I don't know. I haven't looked. It's possible that there's up updates, but I haven't seen anything yet. Well, the future audience will probably know the answer. That's right. Yes. Right now, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, and my phone is about to die. Uh-oh. Let's see here. No, I don't want that. All right. So this is from Science News, uh, ScienceDaily.com. Sorry. Uh, astronomers detect a radio heartbeat billions of light years from Earth. So this is about fast radio bursts. Mm. <clears throat> astronomers at MIT and elsewhere have detected a strange and persistent radio signal from a far-off galaxy that appears to be flashing with surprising regularity. The signal is classified as a fast radio burst, or FRB, in an intensely strong burst, an intensely strong burst of radio waves of unknown astrophysical origin that typically lasts for a few milliseconds at most. However, this new signal persists for up to three seconds, about a thousand times longer than the average FRB. Within this window, the team detected bursts of radio waves that repeat every 0.2 seconds in a clear periodic pattern, similar to a beating heart. The researchers have labeled the signal FRB, really long number, and it is currently the longest lasting FRB, as they all are. Yeah. <laughs> with, uh, it is the currently longest lasting FRB with the clearest periodic pattern detected to date. The source of the signal lies in a distant galaxy several billion light years from Earth. Exactly what that source might be, uh, might be remains a mystery, though astronomers suspect the signal could emanate from either a radio pulsar or a magnetar both of which are types of neutron stars, extremely dense, rapidly spinning, collapsed cores of giant stars. There are not many things in... But, yeah, okay, I have questions, but you, you keep going. Sorry. There are not many things in the universe that emit strictly periodic signals, says Daniel Michili, a postdoc in MIT's Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. Examples that we know of in our galaxy are radio pulsars and magnetars, which rotate and produce a beamed emission similar to a lighthouse. And we think this new signal could be a magnetar or pulsar on, uh, on steroids. The team hopes to detect more periodic signals from this source, which could then be used as an astrophysical clock. For instance, 
The frequency of the bursts and how they change as the source moves away from Earth could be used to measure the rate at which the universe is expanding. Now, that's a cool idea yeah. because it's so periodic. But how would they know if it was just slowing down? <laughs> the discovery is reported today in the journal, in the journal Nature... And it's authored by members of the Chime slash FRB collaboration, including MIT co-authors, blah, 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 a bunch of other people. Since the first FRB was discovered in 2007, hundreds of similar radio flashes have been detected across the universe, most recently by the Canadian Hydro Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or Chime, an interferometric radio telescope consisting of four large parabolic reflectors that is located at the... Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in British Columbia, Canada. Chime continuously observes the sky as the Earth rotates and is designed to pick up radio waves emitted by hydrogen in the very earliest stages of the universe. The telescope also happens to be sensitive to fast radio bursts, and since it began observing the sky in 2018, Chime has detected hundreds of FRBs emanating from different parts of the sky. The vast majority of them... Uh, to date, are one-offs, ultra-bright bursts of radio waves that last for a few milliseconds before blinking off. Recently, researchers discovered the first periodic FRB that appeared to emit a regular pattern of radio waves. This signal consisted of a four-day window of random bursts that then repeated every 16 days. Yeah, you remember this one? This is, I think this is the one we, that I did a bunch of stories on, the 16-day period one. Yeah. This 16-day cycle indicated a periodic pattern of activity Though the signal of the actual radio burst was random rather than periodic. So like 16 days it would come on and do this random flashing and then it would shut off and then 16 days later it would come back on and be a completely different set of flashes. Yeah. Remember that? Yes. These things are so weird. Uh, and this is also reminding me of the actual visible light flashes that we've seen in the sky. Oh, yeah. Yep. Sometimes there's just one flash... Sometimes mm -hmm. there's like a couple, and then there's been a few times when we've sat there and just watched the things flash over and over, but not like a regular period. That's right. Yeah. So maybe there's visible. But every like, six day, every sixteen days is non-random. But then that, the flashes yes. are totally random. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. So yeah. this this new one says, let's see. Well, I'll just keep going. On December twenty first, two thousand nineteen, Chime picked up a signal of a potential FRB which immediately drew the attention of Michili. Michili? I don't know. His last name it looks like Mich Michili, who was scanning the incoming data. It was unusual, he recalls. Not only was it very long, lasting about three seconds, but there were periodic peaks that were remarkably precise, emanating every fraction of a second, boom, 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 like a heartbeat. This is the first time the signal itself is periodic. In analyzing the pattern of this fast radio burst, Michili and his colleagues found similarities with emissions from radio pulsars and magnetars in our galaxy. Radio pulsars are neutron stars that emit beams of radio waves appearing to pulse as the star rotates, while a similar emission is produced by magnetars due to their extreme magnetic fields. The main difference between the new signal and radio emissions from our own galactic pulsars and magnetars is that the FRB appears to be more than a million times brighter. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> we have these objects in our galaxy, but this thing is like a couple of billion light years away. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I'm just like, no, that whatever is happening is way beyond the pulsars that we have next to us. And so I, I just wonder if it's like, if the if there's like this weird Doppler effect that makes it looks, it, it looks to us as being this very rapid thing that takes place in milliseconds but maybe what's actually happening in that place in the universe is like a longer slower process like if you were there yeah you see what i'm saying yes. i don't know or 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 some <clears throat> some lensing object is passing between us and it yeah you yeah know? so yeah if, whatever if there's the like a singularity that moves between us and it somewhere out there and for a brief moment like it gets magnified by oh i see what you're saying yeah and that yeah hmm why would it be random most of the time. There's a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> but then not random every 16 days, right? It's so right. weird. This is so strange to me. It's shotgun blasts. <laughs> so, okay, so <laughs> Michili says that the luminous flashes may originate from a distant radio pulsar or magnetar that is normally less bright 
as it rotates, and for some unknown reason ejected a train of brilliant bursts and a rare three-second window that Chime was lucky, luckily positioned to catch. Chime has now detected many FRBs with different um, properties, Michili says. We've seen some that live inside clouds that are very turbulent, while others look like they're in clean environments. From the properties of this new signal, we can say that around this source, there is a cloud of plasma that must be extremely, extremely turbulent. You hear that? That's a cloud of plasma. <laughs> <laughs> the astronomers hope to catch additional bursts from the periodic FRB, which can help uh, to refine their understanding of its source and of neutron stars in general. I'm so. also, of course, reminded of, you know, the um, the dark forest. Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this is one of the ways in those books, in those stories, the three-body problem that a civilization can speak to the entire universe is by pulsing a star mm -hmm. and if you do it with enough energy or if you find the right resonance um basically in the series that there's this there's this idea that if you if you beam a specific strength of signal at a particular star at the right resonance the star will respond by magnifying it enormously and it can come out looking like a you know, like a, a huge radio burst yeah. coming from the star, but the star is actually just picking up your signal, massively amplifying it, and then pulsing it out in every possible direction. Hmm. But that's that's your civilization being loud. So I wonder if we, if there's like a lot more data in the signal, yeah, that we just can't. That's what pick I'm saying. Is like, you, it's it's like a one time pad, right? You would need to know how to decode it. It's wild. Yeah. But it I is, find it is, if you can do that, it is one way to speak the, to the entire universe. It would take a long time. Yeah. You know, but if you, if you, if you have long-term plans or you don't care how long it takes and you can pulse a star like that, then, then you will know eventually that everything in the universe basically will be able to see the signal if they're looking. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool to, I, I just, this kind of stuff, I just love it because it's, it's like, even if we did ever discover all the laws of physics exactly as they are. Yeah. There's still such an enormous complicated, uh, you know. Yeah, their interactions are complicated. Yeah. Infinite number of possibilities of these things coming together and interacting, which can still create these vast mysteries out there. Yeah. So it's so cool. Um, and that thing that they, they just saw happened... But like probably before the Earth was here, right? It's, oh, yeah. That's the other crazy thing about well, it. Is how like, far away was it? That's, well, maybe it was yeah. two or three billion light years away. It just says billions. Right. I don't know. But still, it's just it like <laughs> it, the event took place before life on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. So whatever made it is long gone. It's wild. Man, yeah, that is interesting to think of. Okay, so moving on, uh, something a little closer to home here. This is from phys.org. Um, scientists propose solution to long puzzling fusion problem. Ah. The paradox startled scientists at the U.S. Department of Energy's DOE Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, more, uh, PPPL, purple, P -p 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 <laughs> more than a dozen years ago. The more heat they beamed into a spherical tokamak, a magnetic facility designed to reproduce the fusion energy that powers the sun and stars, the less the, uh, the, less the central temperature increased. So taking out the inside, the, the middle of that sentence, the more heat they beamed into the tokamak, the less the central temperature increased. Mm. Hmm. Big mystery. Normally... The more beam power you put in, the higher the temperature gets, said Stephen Jardin, head of the theory and computational science group that performed the calculations and lead author of a proposed explanation published in Physical Review Letters. So this was a big mystery. Why does this happen? Solving the mystery could contribute to efforts around the world to create and control fusion on Earth to produce a virtually inexhaustible source of safe, clean, and carbon-free energy to generate electricity while... Fighting climate change. Fusion combines light elements in the form of plasma, 
to release massive amounts of energy. Through recent high-resolution computer simulations, Jardin and colleagues showed that what can cause the temperature to stay flat or even to decrease in the center of the plasma that fuels fusion reactions, even as more heating power is beamed in. Increasing the power also raises pressure in the plasma to the point where the plasma becomes unstable and the plasma motion flattens out the temperature, they found. These simulations likely explain an experimental observation made over 12 years ago, Jardin said. The results indicate that when designing and operating the spherical tokamak experiments, care must be taken to ensure that the plasma pressure does not exceed certain critical values at certain locations in the facility, he said. And we now have a way of quantifying these values through computer simulations. Um, so the findings highlight a key hurdle for researchers to avoid when seeking to reproduce fusion reactions in spherical tokamaks. Uh, and the, these devices are shaped more like cord apples than more widely used donut-shaped conventional tokamaks. The spherical devices produce cost-effective magnetic fields that are candidates to become models for a pilot fusion power plant. Hmm. So this is cool. Yeah, I'm that's like, cool. And then they, they have some diagrams here that are like, I, I guess they're, tr it's like showing the, um, like his basic theory on what's happening in the plasma and how it flattens out. And and I guess, I don't know, it's almost like, I'm, I'm kind of equating it to like something's going on akin to boiling. It's yeah. like when you're trying it's to heat water. It's regulating its own temperature. Yes. Yep. It starts to do some kind of convective motion or some kind of... And, some kind of action yeah. that sheds the heat. Makes so, sense. Yeah, that's, that's what came to mind to me. Because, um, yeah, you can keep beaming heat at water, but it's... Yeah, fusion power would be amazing. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, glad they're working on I got another one, but, I mean, we're already over time here, yeah. so yeah. we can do it next week. All right. It's about dreams. <laughs> All right. Well... We'll be right back, folks. We will. Now, it's obvious to everybody that the phenomena of the world are evidently irreversible. And that I mean things happen that don't happen the other way. You drop a cup and it breaks, and you can sit there a long time waiting for the pieces to come together, to come back into your hands. You watch the waves breaking at the sea, you stand there and wait for the great moment when the foam collects together, rises up out of the sea, and falls back further out from the shore. It would be very pretty. As a matter of fact, the demonstration of this in such lectures is usually made by having a section of moving picture in which you take a number of phenomena and running the thing backwards and then see all the laughter. The laughter just means this ain't going to happen in the real world. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, for the uh, what fourth installment? I don't know. The, I haven't been numbering them. The Feynman lectures <laughs> the on the character one. of physical law, <laughs> and it's like the fifth lecture in the fourth episode, or something. Something like that. This one is the distinction of past and future, and uh, I'm actually hoping that we're going to get through this one, and then um, probability and uncertainty as well. And then we'll finish up the, the series with uh, Seeking New Laws next week. Yeah. So continuing with what Feynman was saying there, uh, the laughter just means this would not happen in the real world. But actually, that is a rather weak way to put something which is as obvious and deep as the difference between the past and the future. Because even without an experiment, our very experiences inside are completely different for past and future. We remember the past. We do not remember the future. We have a different kind of awareness about what might happen than what we have of what probably has happened. The past and the future look completely different psychologically with concepts like memory and apparent freedom of will. Right. Apparent. He questions free will. Mm. We're it's, just. We're it's just, only apparent. Well, yeah, because we're just uh, we're just masses following the laws of physics. That's right. We're just we're just very complicated machines, right? Uh, in the sense that we feel that we can do something to affect the future, but none of us, or very few of us, believe that there is anything we can do to affect the past. Remorse and regret and hope 
and so forth, are all words which distinguish perfectly, obviously, the past and the future. Now, if the world of nature is made of atoms, and we too are made of atoms and obey physical laws, the most obvious interpretation of this evident distinction between past and future, and this irreversibility of all phenomena, would be that some laws, some of the motion laws of the atoms, are going one way, that the atom laws are not such that they can go either way. There should be somewhere in the work some kind of a principle that, and I'm not sure how to say this, maybe we should have listened to it, that uxels only make wuxels is how it's written. <laughs> U-X-L-E-S only make W-X-L-E-S. Hmm. W-U-L-E-S. Okay, so he says, yeah, uxels only make wuxels and never vice versa. And so the world is turning from uxley character to wuxley character all the time. And this one-way business of the interactions of things should be the thing that makes the whole phenomena of the world seem to go one way. But we have not found this yet. That is, in all the laws of physics that we have found so far, there does not seem to be any distinction between the past and the future. The moving picture should work the same going both ways, and the physicist who looks at it should not laugh. Let us take the law of gravitation as our standard example. If I have a sun and a planet, and I start the planet off in some direction going around the sun, and then I take a moving picture and run the moving picture backwards and look at it, what happens? The planet goes around the sun in the opposite way, of course, and keeps on going around in an ellipse. The speed of the planet is such that the area swept out by the radius is always the same in equal times. In fact, it goes just exactly the way it ought to go. It cannot be distinguished from going the other way. Now, why does he use that example? Because... If you think of like, well, let's say this comet comes in That's and it falls thought. into the sun. Yeah, an impact would be, you would, you would obviously see that that couldn't go the other direction. It seems like, right? But, he, but what he's saying is, is even with that event, if you zoom way in. Yeah, of course. Everything's obeying the law. Right. Even if it's Then there's nothing that's happening that's wrong. But I agree. Like when I first read this, I was like, yeah, okay, for an orbit, if you reverse it, you wouldn't even actually be able to tell that it isn't correct right. time-wise. Time but for something like an impact or dropping a cup, it's immediately obvious that it can only go in one direction or that it only ever does go in one direction. But if you looked at it on the molecular scale, you wouldn't be able to tell. Right. Yeah. But okay. I was just thinking specifically about the laws of gravity, that if you, if you were looking at it on the small scale... But you knew that the you knew the sun's mass and you knew all the whatever, and then you see this thing just moving away from the sun. Yeah, and it's I guess it it would start out going really fast and have escape velocity, and then slowly slow down <laughs> as it got further away, yeah. and it would look fine. <laughs> Is that what would happen? <laughs> yeah. Is terminal velocity well, escape velocity? Well, let's take a. Um, Do you know? Let's let's. No, no, terminal velocity is not escape velocity. So terminal velocity is about uh, usually like uh, atmospheric interference. Oh, OK. Gotcha. Right. So like I'm thinking of like, yeah. So if it was if, anyway, I was getting in the weeds. But <laughs> if it's if it's if this thing is going really fast and then it, it's pulled in and it hits the sun, then it. Yeah. The, the speed of it could be escape velocity if it was going the other direction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't think you'd be able to tell. OK. Yeah. Like what, what we just read about uh, on Space Weather News that, you know, there was a CME that came off the sun. Now, what if you watch that in reverse and you watch this big, massive gas fly and hit the sun and yeah. cause an explosion? Yeah. Would it look right? You know, probably. Okay. Some of it might look weird if yeah. you were able to this look is closely. Just, it's just weird. <laughs> okay. So the law of gravitation is of such a kind that the direction does not make any difference. If you show any phenomenon involving only gravitation running backwards on a film, it will look perfectly satisfactory. You can put it more precisely this way. If all the particles in a more complicated system were to have every one of their speeds reversed suddenly, then the thing would just unwind through all the things that, wound it up, wound, that it wound up into. If you have a lot of particles doing something and then you suddenly reverse the speed, they will completely undo what they did before. This is in the law of gravitation, which says that the velocity changes as a result of the forces. If I reverse the time, the for forces are not changed, so the changes in velocity are not altered at corresponding distances. So each velocity then has a succession of alterations made in exactly the reverse of the way that they were made before, 
and it is easy to prove that the law of gravitation is time reversible. Okay, so he is saying that even if you took the impact and you reversed it, it would be fine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Huh. But that's just with the gravity. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Not the, not the thing flying to pieces and all that kind right, of stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. So the law of electricity and magnetism, these are time reversible. The laws of nuclear interaction, time reversible as far as we can tell. The laws of beta decay that we talked about at a previous time, are these also time reversible? The difficulty of the experiments a few months ago, which indicate that there is something the matter, some unknown about the laws. And I think on this, he's talking about the muon stuff, the meson decay. Uh, suggests, this suggests the possibility that in fact, beta decay may not also be time reversible and we shall have to wait for more experiments to see but at least the following is true beta decay which may or may not be time reversible is a very unimportant phenomenon for most ordinary circumstances the possibility of my talking to you does not depend on beta decay although it does depend on chemical interactions it depends on electrical forces not much on nuclear forces at the moment but it also depends on gravitation but i am one-sided i speak and a voice goes out into the air and it does not come sucking back into my mouth when I open it. And this irreversibility cannot be hung on the phenomenon of beta decay. In other words, we believe that most of the ordinary phenomena in the world, which are produced by atomic motions, are according to laws which can be completely reversed. So we will have to look some more to find the explanation of the irreversibility. If we look at our planets moving around the sun more carefully, we, find, we soon find that all is not quite right. For example, the Earth's rotation on its axis is slightly slowing down. This is due to tidal friction. And you can see that friction is something which is obviously irreversible. If I take a heavy weight on the floor and push it, it will slide and stop. If I stand and wait, it does not suddenly start up and speed up and come into my hand. So the frictional effect seems to be irreversible. But a frictional effect, as we discussed at another time, is the result of the enormous complexity of the interactions of the weight of the wood, the jiggling of the atoms inside, and the organized motion of the weight is changed into disorganized, irregular wiggle waggles of the atoms in the wood. So therefore, we should look at the thing more closely. As a matter of fact, we have here the clue to the apparent irre irreversibility. I will take a simple example. Suppose we have blue water with ink and white water, that is without ink, in a tank with a little separation, and then we pull out the separation very delicately. The water starts separate, blue on one side and white on the other. And then we wait a while, and gradually the blue mixes up with the white, and after a while the water is luke blue, or sort of 50-50, the color uniformly distributed throughout. Now if we wait and watch this for a long time, it does not by itself separate. You could do something to get the blue separated again. You could evaporate the water and condense it somewhere else and collect the blue dye and dissolve it in half the water and put the thing back. But while you were doing all of that, you would, you, you would yourself be causing irreversible phenomena somewhere else. <laughs> By itself, it does not go the other way. So that gives us some clue. We look at the molecules. Suppose that we take a moving picture of the blue and white water mixing. It will look funny if we run it backwards because we shall start with uniform water and gradually the thing will separate and it will obviously be nutty. Now, if we magnify the picture so that every physicist can watch atom by atom to find out what happens irreversibly, where the laws of balance of forward and backward break down. So you start and you look at the picture. You have atoms of two different kinds. Let's, it's ridiculous, but let's call them blue and white. And they're jiggling all the time in thermal motion. If we were to start at the beginning, we should have mostly atoms of one kind on one side and atoms of the other kind on the other side. And now these atoms are jiggling around, billions and billions of them. And if we start them with one kind all on one side and the other kind on the other side, we see that in their perpetual irregular motions, they will get mixed up. And that is why the water becomes more or less uniformly blue. So let us watch any one collision selected from that picture. And in the moving picture, the atoms come together this way and bounce off that way. And now run that section of the film backwards and you find the pair of molecules moving together the other way and bouncing off this way. And the physicist looks with his keen eye and measures everything and says, that's all right. That's according to the laws of physics. If two molecules came this way, they would bounce off that way. It is reversible. The laws of molecular collision are reversible. So if you watch too carefully, you cannot understand it at all. 
because every one of the collisions is absolutely reversible. And yet the whole moving picture shows something absurd, which is that in the reversed picture, the molecules start in the mixed condition, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. And as time goes on through all the collisions, the blue separates from the white. But they cannot do that. It is not natural that the accidents of life should be such that the blues will separate themselves from the whites. And yet if you watch this reversed movie very carefully, every collision is okay. Well, you see that uh, all there is to it is that the irreversibility is caused by the general accidents of life. If you start with a thing that is separated and make irregular changes, it does get more uniform. But if it starts uniform and you make irregular changes, it does not get separated. It could get separated. It is not against the laws of physics that the molecules bounce around so that they separate. It is just unlikely. It would never happen in a million years. And that is the answer. Things are irreversible only in a sense that going one way is likely, but going the other way, although it is possible and is according to the laws of physics, it would not happen in a million years. It is just ridiculous to expect that if you sit there long enough, the jiggling of the atoms will separate a uniform mixture of ink and water into ink on one side and water on the other. So I love that. That's it's it's basically just saying it could happen. Right. <clears throat> the way I look at it is it's like, I think he might say this later, but it's, it's about the number of possibilities, right? Like yeah. here, here's all the, po the possible things that could happen. Yeah. And so separating into the uniform, you know, blue on one side and white on the other side is like an extremely limited number of possibilities. Yeah. Whereas it's the any only... other arrangement is, is, <laughs> yeah. has like infinite possibilities. Of, right. So that out of all the possible configurations of the billions and billions and billions of molecules, there's only one very specific one where it's separated. Right. Where there, where there are trillions and trillions and trillions of possible configurations where they're not. Right. So the likelihood that you'll land on this particular separated one is very low. Yeah. But not, not impossible. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah. So in the vast expanse of the universe and time some very unlikely things happen yeah yeah and i bet that for example if you ran this experiment and they did configure themselves into blue and white then the first thing the person would look for is some outside force causing it to take place rather than just probability because mm -hmm. that's the first thing you think of like what made that happen yeah Something pulled all the blue ones yeah. <laughs> over to this side somehow. Yeah. Okay, so he's so going on with Feynman, he says, he says, now, if I had put a box around my experiment so that there were only four or five molecules of each kind in the box, as time went on, they would get mixed up. But I think you could believe that if you kept watching in the, in the perpetual irregular collisions of these molecules after some time, not necessarily a million years, maybe only a year, you would see that accidentally they would get back more or less to their original state, at least in the sense that if I put a barrier through the middle, all the whites would be on one side and all the blues on the other. It is not impossible. However, the actual objects with which we work have not only four or five blues and whites, they have four or five million, 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 which are all going to get separated like this. And so the apparent irreversibility of nature does not come from the irreversibility of the fundamental physical laws, it comes from the characteristic that if you start with an ordered system and have the irregularities of nature, the balancing of molecules, then the thing goes one way. And that's, that's another way of saying what we were just at, like, the mm -hmm. order is, is one state. There right. are millions of disorderly states. Right. There's only one, you know, or very few at least, maybe not just one, but there's very few states where it's, it's in an order. Or much fewer. So, but yeah. So even though there might be billions of possible collisions that would result in ultimately all of the the atoms being separated, there's so many more possibilities of of the random yeah. distribution. Yeah. That it's that that's the point. There, there's a lot of possible right. ways that they could collide that would ultimately r result in them being separated. Yeah. But yeah, not nearly as the, much. As if you've got a trillion, 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 trillion blue <laughs> molecules, they could have lots of configurations on one side. Yeah, yeah. But the number of configurations where they're all mixed up together yeah, is just, just vastly so greater. much more. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. Okay, so therefore the next question is, how did they get ordered in the first place? That is to say, why is it possible to start with the ordered? The difficulty is that we start with an ordered thing and we do not end up with an ordered thing. One of the rules of the world is that the thing goes from an ordered condition to a disordered. Incidentally, this word order, like the word disorder, is another of these terms of physics which are not exactly the same as in ordinary life. The order need not be interesting to you as human beings. It is just that there is a definite situation, all on one side and all on the other, or they are mixed up, and that is ordered and disordered. The question, then, is how the thing gets ordered in the first place, and why, when we look at any ordinary situation, which is only partly ordered, we can conclude that it probably came from one which was more ordered. If I look at a tank of water in which the water is very dark blue on one side and very clear white on the other, and a sort of bluish color in between, I know that the thing has been left alone for 20 or 30 minutes. And then I will guess that it got this way because the separation was more complete in the past. And if I wait longer, then the blue and white will get more intermixed. And if I know that this thing has been left alone for a sufficiently long time, I can conclude something about the past condition. The fact that it is smooth at the sides can only arise because it was much more satisfactorily separated in the past, because if it were not more satisfactorily separated in the past, in the time since then, it would become more mixed up. It is therefore possible to tell from the present something about the past. In fact, physicists do not usually do this much. Physicists like to think that all you have to do is say, these are the conditions, what happens next? But all of our sister sciences have a completely different problem. In fact, all of the other things that are studied, history, geology, ast astronomical history, have a problem of this other kind. I find that they are able to make predictions of a completely different type from those of a, of a physicist. A physicist will say, in this condition, I'll tell you what will happen next. But a geologist will say something like this. I have dug in the ground and I have found certain kinds of bones. I predict that if you dig in the ground, you will find a similar kind of bone. The historian, although he talks about the past, can do it by talking about the future. When he says that the French Revolution was in 1789, he means that if you look in another book about the French Revolution, you will find the same date. <laughs> <laughs> what he does is to make a kind of prediction about something that he has never looked at before, documents that have still to be found, and he predicts that the documents in which there is something written about Napoleon will coincide with what is written in other documents. The question is how that is possible, and the only way that that is possible is to suggest that the past of the world was more organized in this sense than the present. Some people have proposed that the way the world became ordered is this. In the beginning, the whole universe was just irregular motions, like the mixed water. We saw that if you waited long enough with very few atoms, the water could have gotten separated accidentally. So some physicists about a century ago suggested that all that, uh, all that has happened is that the world, this system that has been going on and going on, fluctuated. That is the term used when it gets a little out of ordinary uniform condition. So it fluctuated, and now we are watching the fluctuation undo itself. So you may say, but look how long you would have to wait for such a fluctuation. I know, but if it did not fluctuate far enough to be able to produce evolution, to be able to produce an intelligent person, we would not have noticed it. <laughs> so this is the... This is like the anthropic principle, basically, he's putting in there right <laughs> like well yes it had to be yes you can point out like how big this fluctuation was but what he's saying is is it had to be that big for you to be here to point it out <laughs> so it isn't actually that surprising that it's a big fluctuation yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to keep on waiting until we were alive to notice it we had to have at least that big a fluctuation. But I believe this theory to be incorrect. I think it is a ridiculous theory for the following reason. If the world were much bigger and the atoms were all over the place starting from a completely mixed up condition, then if I happened to look only at the atoms in one place and I found the atoms there separated, I would have no way to conclude that the atoms anywhere else would be separated. In fact, if the thing were a fluctuation and I noticed something odd, the most likely way it got there would be that there was nothing odd anywhere else. That is, I would have to borrow odds, so to speak, to get the thing lopsided, and there is no use borrowing too much. In the experiment with the blue and white water, when eventually the few molecules in the box became separated, the most likely condition of the rest of the water would still be mixed up. And therefore, although when we look at the stars and we look at the world and we see everything is ordered, 
if there were a fluctuation, the prediction would be that if we looked at a place where we have not looked before, it would be disordered and a mess. Although the separation of the matter into stars, which are hot, and space, which is cold, which we have seen, could be a fluctuation, then in places where we have not looked, we would expect to find that the stars are not separated from space. And since we always make the prediction that in a place where we have not looked, we shall see stars in a similar condition or find the same statement about Napoleon or that we shall see bones like the bones we have seen before, the success of all those sciences indicates that the world did not come from a fluctuation but came from a condition which was more separate and more organized in the past than at the present time. That's a strange argument. I mean, the, what, the, the, I guess I'm not really clear on what he means by the fluctuation. Like, what, what is the, the theory is that everything is natural state is to be ordered and then there was a fluctuation that caused disorder? No, the, na the natural state is a uniform disorder. Okay, and then something fluctuated, and so things became ordered. Right. So we lost the uniformity of disorder, and now we have a pocket of orderliness inside of an enormous system of disorderliness. Like the little box around the... Right. Four so our five. entire universe with all of its stars and galaxies is this fluctuation within okay. an enormous thing of disorderly uniformity. Okay, so his... What is his objection to that? He's saying that in order to get... That, that in any other system that you might be studying where that happened, you have to borrow orderliness from somewhere else in order to stack it up somewhere. But if you start with uniform disorderliness, you can't really do that. I think that's what he's saying. Okay. I, yeah. It's a strange way to put the argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says you have to borrow odds to get the thing lopsided, but there's no use borrowing too much. Yeah. Then I'm not sure why he keeps adding in the Napoleon and the history and the bones and stuff in there. Like how how does how does a historian who's who is like pretty sure that in in, in some other book that he may not have looked at yet that the you know Napoleon or whether will have the same dates, how does that contribute to like order orderliness in the past versus more disorder in the future? I didn't. I couldn't make that connection. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This whole <laughs> argument is is interesting. I like. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not really <laughs> following it. Really. Yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, him adding that. I understand the the main principle though, but it's yeah. just he's putting all this stuff in there that it's. I don't know if he's just trying to be funny. Yeah, maybe he is making jokes. Because I think he just trashed the historian. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's never witnessed anything. He's just, he's only making a statement about. Knowing that probably that date's going to be the same in some other book he hasn't read. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. about all he's doing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. By speaking about the past, he's making a prediction about the future. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he says... I ther therefore, I think it is necessary to add to the physical laws the hypothesis that... In the past, the universe was more ordered in the technical sense than it is today, and I think this is the additional statement that is needed to make sense and to make an understanding of the irreversibility. That statement itself is, of course, lopsided in time. It says that, it says that something about the past is different from the future, but it comes outside the province of what we ordinarily call physical laws because... We try today to distinguish between the statement of the physical laws which govern the rules by which the universe develops and the law which states the condition that the world was in in the past. This is considered to be astronomical history. Perhaps someday it will also be part of physical law. All right. So that's interesting because he's right. He, like the, the previous chapter when we were talking about symmetry, he was talking about symmetry of time. And then he had to make the, you know, he had to make the, the caveat that like, well, of course, this excludes something like the Big Bang. Right. Yeah. And now he's talking about uh, this also doesn't work when you're, it, it doesn't work in terms of physical laws and symmetry, but astronomical history, he's saying, is basically a different thing. In other words, if you, if you go back in time, the universe changes. It doesn't look the same as it does today. Right. So there isn't a symmetry there, but that's astronomical history. Not, it's not about um, fundamental laws. Yeah. Okay. So now he, now he goes through a whole description of a, um, he's trying to show something and he's basically talking about a machine, an imaginary machine that can only turn one way. Um, it's basically like a sawtooth ratchet 
powered by gas, <laughs> by by Brownian motion of yeah, gas yeah. molecules. And if you make it so that the ratchet can only turn in one direction, that the irregular impacts of the gas molecules hitting the little fan blades will result in the thing only being able to ratchet over in one direction because the ratchet keeps it from going the other way. But he just explains that if you give it enough time, everything heats up and then eventually it'll just go in both directions and basically effectively stop moving. Right. But yeah, you could start out and be like, look, I built a perpetual motion machine. It'll only turn in one direction. It'll keep doing it. But technically speaking, it'll it'll, it'll heat up and then it stops working. So you have to maintain it all the time. Right. Uh, Okay, so he says the conservation of energy would let us think that we have as much energy as we want. Nature never loses or gains energy. Yet the energy of the sea, for example, the thermal motion of all the atoms in the sea is practically unavailable to us. In order to get that energy organized and herded and make it available for use, we have to have a difference in temperature or else we shall find that although the energy is there, we cannot make use of it. There is a great difference between energy and availability of energy. The energy of the sea is a large amount, but it is not available to us. I think this is a great point. Yes. The conservation of energy means that the total energy in the world, and I think he just means in the the universe, universe. yeah, is kept the same. But in the irregular jigglings that energy can be spread around so uniformly that in certain circumstances, there is no way to make more go one way than the other. There is no way to control it. I think that by an analogy, I can give some idea of the difficulty in this way. I do not know if you have ever had the experience, I have, of sitting on the beach with several towels and suddenly a tremendous downpour comes. And you pick up the towels as quickly as you can and you run into the bathhouse. Then you start to dry yourself and you find that this towel is a little wet, but it is drier than you are. And you keep drying with this one until you find that it is too wet. It is wetting you as much as drying you. (laughs) Then you try another one and pretty soon you discover a horrible thing that all the towels are as damp. Are, are, are damp and so are you. There is no way to get any drier even though you have many towels <laughs> because there is no difference in some sense between the wetness of the towels and the wetness of yourself. I could invent a kind of quantity which I could call ease of removing water. The towel has the same ease of removing water from it as you have. So when you touch yourself with the towel, as much water comes off the towel onto you as comes from you onto the towel. <laughs> It does not mean that there is the same amount of water in the towel as there is on you. A big towel will have more water in it than a little towel, but they have the same dampness. And when things get to the same dampness, then there is nothing you can do any longer. Like, I love that (laughs) I could just picture him trying to dry off and coming to this realization that he isn't going to get any drier with this collection of towels (laughs) and then working it out in his mind. About uniform dampness. <laughs> it's a good analogy, though. It's yeah. like that's that that's why I like to think of the, you know, we say the potential, you know, in an electric current or whatever. And so you think of the the difference. You've got to have this difference. Yes, in With, potential. In a very wet person in a very dry towel, have, there's a lot of potential. Yeah, you can have all this. <laughs> you can have all this energy, but if you and the energy or the thing that the, 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 what you're trying to do with the energy, you need the difference into potential to get it to go yeah. in a direction. You need it to move in one this way, orderly direction, yeah. so that you can turn something. Right. Well, if there's just as much energy on the other side, then you, there's potential energy. Then it won't really go anywhere. Right. It might move back and forth a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the big, yeah, the big issue is getting, is, is finding the energy that's a whole lot in one place and none in the other or yeah. very little in the other place. Right. Or, or just very little of the kind you're trying to move. Right. Yeah. I just love that it's about towels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yes, between between you getting right after you get out of the shower and a very dry towel, there's a lot of potential. Yeah. The water just like yeah, is just moving move right into off that towel. you <laughs> off of you and directly onto the towel and you basically can get dry. <laughs> but <laughs> if the towel was in the shower with you, 
there's there's no chance <laughs> that it's going to move from you and onto the towel. <laughs> It'll be an equal exchange. So he says, now the water is like the energy because the total amount of water is not changing. If the bathhouse door is open and you can run into the sun and get dried out or find another towel, then you're saved. But suppose everything is closed and you can't get away from these towels or get any new towels. In the same way, if you imagine a part of the world that is closed and wait long enough, in the accidents of the world, the energy, like the water, will be distributed all over the parts evenly until there is nothing left of one wayness, nothing left of the real interest of the world as we experience it. So thus, in the example of the ratchet, uh, which is a limited one in which nothing else is involved, the temperatures gradually become equal on both sides and the wheel does not go around either one way or the other. In the same way, the situation is that if you leave any system long enough, it gets the energy thoroughly mixed up in it and no more energy is really available to do anything. Incidentally, the thing that corresponds to the dampness or ease of removing water is called the temperature. And although I say when two things are at the same temperature, things get balanced, it does not mean they have the same energy in them. It just means that it is just as easy to pick energy off of one as to pick it off of the other. Temperature is like the ease of removing energy. So if you sit them next to each other, nothing apparently happens. They pass energy back and forth equally, but the net result is nothing. So when things have become all of the same temperature, there is no more energy available to do anything. The principle of irreversibility is that if things are at different temperatures and are left to themselves, as time goes on, they become more and more at the same temperature and the availab availability of energy is perpetually decreasing. This is another name for what is called the entropy law, which says that entropy is always increasing. But never mind the words. Stated the other way, the availability of energy is always decreasing. And that is a characteristic of the world in the sense that it is due to the chaos of molecular irregular motions. Things of different temperature, if left to themselves, tend, tend to become of the same temperature. If you have two things at the same temperature, like water on an ordinary stove without a fire under it, the water is not going to freeze and the stove is not going to get hot. But if you have a hot stove with ice, it goes the other way. So the one wayness is always to the loss of the availability of energy. Hmm. Yeah. That's great. It would be cool to have a stove, but like you put water on it, turn it on, and it freezes the ice. <laughs> it freezes the and water. The stove, or it freezes the water and, and the, the stove, stove gets hot. <laughs> <laughs> it just pulls the heat out of it. <laughs> So he says, that is all I want to say on the subject, but I want to make a few remarks about some characteristics. Here we have an example, which is an obvious effect, the irreversibility. It is not an obvious consequence of the laws, but is in fact rather far from the basic laws. It takes a lot of analysis to understand the reason for it. The effect is of first importance in the economy of the world, in the real behavior of the world, in all obvious things. My memory, my characteristics, the difference between past and future are completely involved in this, and yet the understanding of it is not available by knowing about the laws. It takes a lot of analysis. It is often the case that the laws of physics do not have an obvious direct relevance to experience, but that they are abstract from experience to varying degrees. In this particular case, the fact that the laws are reversible, although the phenomena are not, is an example. Yeah. Is it break time? Yep. Probably should take is. a break. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. It's not reversible. Snakes! Can't go back. In the beginning of the history of experimental observation or any other kind of observation on scientific things, it's intuition, which is really based on just experience with everyday objects that suggest reasonable explanations for things. But as we try to widen and make more consistent our description of what we see, as it gets wider and wider and we see a greater range of phenomena, the explanations become what we call laws instead of simple explanations. But the one important odd characteristic is that they often seem to become more and more unreasonable more and more intuitively far from obvious. Trying to make 
What is it? Maca everything and other stuff. Maca, Maca everything and other stuff over here, Brothers of the Servant Podcast. <laughs> A joke that didn't get made on the last show. That's right. I had to bring it up. Cheery everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your favorite uh, breakfast cereal. <laughs> you just need a Cheerio particle. I think that's what they were saying in the Discord. Cheerio particles. Macro everything and other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because you can't actually. They won't all be macaronis. macaronis and, yeah. cheese and cheese is not really. Yeah, right. It's just going to be macro everything and other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> if all if all atoms were unique. <laughs> you couldn't have macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> How would we survive? Life would be hard. Yeah. All right. Where was I? Um, you had like two pages left of that thing. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. So there are often great distances between the detailed laws and the main aspects of a real phenomena. For example, if you watch a glacier from a distance and see the big rocks falling into the sea and the way the ice moves and so forth. You'd have to have a giant beard. (laughs) Yes. It is not really essential to remember that it is made out of little hexagonal ice crystals. Yet if understood well enough, the motion of the glacier is in fact a consequence of the character of these hexagonal ice crystals. But it takes quite a while to understand all the behavior of the glacier. In fact, nobody knows enough about ice yet, no matter how much they've studied the crystal. However, the hope is that if we do understand the ice crystal, we shall ultimately understand the glacier. In fact, although we have been talking in these lectures about the fundamentals or the fundaments of the physical physical laws, I must say immediately that one does not, by knowing all of the fundamental laws as we know them today, immediately obtain an understanding of anything much. It takes a while, and even then it is only partial. Nature, as a matter of fact, seems to be so designed that the most important things in the real world appear to be a kind of complicated accidental result of a lot of laws. To give an example, nuclei, which are which involve several nuclear particles, protons and neutrons, are very complicated. They have what we call energy levels, and they can sit in states or conditions of different energy values, and various nuclei have various energy levels. And it's a complicated mathematical problem, which we can only partly solve to find the position of the energy levels. The exact position of the levels is obviously a consequence of an enormous complexity, and therefore there is no particular mystery about the fact that nitrogen, with 15 particles inside, happens to have a level of 2.4 million volts, and another level at 7.1, and so on. But the remarkable thing about nature is that the whole universe in its character depends on precisely the position of one particular level in one particular nucleus. In the carbon-12 nucleus, it so happens there is a level at 7.82 million volts, and that makes all the difference in the world. So the situation is the following. If we start with hydrogen, and it appears that at the beginning the world was practically all hydrogen, then as as the hydrogen comes together under gravity and gets hotter nuclear reactions can take place and it can form helium and then the helium can combine only partially with the hydrogen and produce a few more elements a little heavier but these heavier elements disintegrate right away back into helium therefore for a while there was a great mystery about where all the other elements in the world came from because starting with hydrogen the cooking process inside of stars would not make much more than helium and less than half a dozen other elements faced with this problem professors Hoyle and Salpeter said that there was one way out. Salt if Peter? It's S-A-L. It looks like Saltpeter, but there's no T. Oh. So Salpeter? I don't know. Oh, Salpeter. Okay. Yeah. If three helium atoms could come together to form a carbon, we can easily calculate how often that should happen in a star. And it turns out that it should never happen except for one possible accident. If there happened to be an energy level at 7.82 million volts in carbon then the three helium atoms could come together, and before they came apart, they would stay together for a little longer on average than they would do if there were no level at 7.82. And staying there a little longer, there would be enough time for something else to happen and to make other elements. If there was a level at 7.82 million volts in carbon, then we could understand where all the other elements in the periodic table came from. And so, by a backhanded, upside-down argument, it was predicted that there is in carbon a level at 7.82 million volts, 
and experiments in the laboratory showed that indeed there is. Therefore, the existence in all the world of all these other elements is very closely related to the fact that there is this particular level in carbon. But the position of this particular level in carbon seems to us, knowing the physical laws, to be a very complicated accident of 12 complicated particles interacting. This example is an excellent illustration of the fact that an understanding of the physical laws does not necessarily give you an understanding of things of significance in the world in any direct way. The details of real experience are often very far from the fundamental laws. We have a way of discussing the world when we talk of it at various hierarchies or levels. Now, I do not mean to be very precise, dividing the world into definite levels, but I will indicate by describing a set of ideas what I mean by hierarchies of ideas. For example, at one end we have the fundamental laws of physics, then we invent other terms for concepts which are approximate, which have, we believe, their ultimate explanation in terms of the fundamental laws. For instance, heat. Heat is supposed to be jiggling, and the word for hot, a hot thing, is just the word for a mass of atoms which are jiggling. But for a while, if we are talking about heat, we sometimes forget about the atoms jiggling, just as when we talk about the glacier, we do not always think of the hexagonal ice and the snowflakes which originally fell. Another example of the same thing is a salt crystal. Looked at fundamentally, it is a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons, but we have this concept of salt crystal, which carries a whole pattern already of fundamental interactions. An idea like pressure is the same. Now, if we go up higher from this, in another, another level, we have properties of substances like refractive index, how light is bent when it goes through something, or surface tension, the fact that water tends to pull itself together, both of which are described by numbers. I remind you that we have to go through several laws down to find out that it is the pull of atoms and so on. But still, we say surface tension, and do not always worry when discussing surface tension about the inner workings. On up in the hierarchy with water, we have waves and we have a thing like a storm and the word storm, which represents an enormous mass of phenomena or a sunspot or star, which is an accumulation of things. And it is not worthwhile always to think of it all the way back. In fact, we cannot because the higher up we go, the more steps we have in between, each one of which is a little weak. We have not thought them all through yet. As we go up in this hierarchy of complexity, we get to things like muscle twitches or nerve impulses, which is an enormously complicated thing in the physical world, involving an organization of matter in a very elaborate complexity. And then come things like frog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> frog. <laughs> And then we go on and we come to words and concepts like man and history or political expediency and so forth, a series of concepts which we use to understand things at an even higher level. And going on, we come to things like evil and beauty and hope. So which end is nearer to God, if I may use a religious metaphor, beauty and hope or the fundamental laws? I think that the right way, of course, is to say that what we have to look at is the whole structural interconnection of the thing, and that all the sciences, and not just the sciences, but all the efforts of intellectual, intellectual kinds are an endeavor to see the connections of the hierarchies, to connect beauty to history, to connect history to man's psychology, and man's psychology to the working of the brain, and the brain to the neural impulse, and the neural impulse to the chemistry, and so forth, up and down, both ways. And today we cannot, and it is no use making believe that we can, Draw carefully a line all the way from one end of this thing to the other, because we have only just begun to see that there is this relative hierarchy. And I do not think that either end is nearer to God. To stand at either end and to walk off that end of the pier only, hoping that out in that direction is the complete understanding, is a mistake. And to stand with evil and beauty and hope, or to stand with the fundamental laws, hoping that, hoping that way to get a deep understanding of the whole world with that aspect alone, is a mistake. It is not sensible for the ones who specialize at one end and the ones who specialize at the other end to have such disregard for each other. They don't actually, but people say that they do. The great mass of workers in between connecting one step to another are improving all of the time our understanding of the world, both from working at the ends and working in the middle, and in that way we are gradually understanding this tremendous world of interconnecting hierarchies. That's really awesome. Yeah. I love that. Great way to end that lecture. Okay, lecture six, probability and uncertainty, the quantum mechanical view of nature. So uh, at the break, you heard Feynman speaking the beginning of this lecture. So I'll start from part of that here. He says, one odd characteristic 
is that they often seem to become more and more unreasonable, they being uh, they being the these phenomena. They become more and more unreasonable and more and more intuitively far from obvious. To take an example, in the relativity theory, the proposition is that if you think two things occur at the same time, that is just your opinion. Someone else could conclude that of those events, one was before the other, and that therefore simultaneity is merely a subjective impression. So when I read this, I was thinking like last episode, I got this wrong about the, because I gave the example of two stars going nova, and that depending on where you are, you may think that they were thousands of, they appear to take place thousands of years apart, but if you're in a different place, they might look like they happen at the same time. So what I think, based on what he just said here, that what I was getting wrong was starting out saying that they happen at the same time and saying that depending on your perspective, you would see them taking place at different. What he's saying is your perspective is what matters. I think is what he's saying here. Yeah. So that's just me. It's just a strange way to look at it, but it's, it's like that thing that you were just reading about in the first segment about this fast radio burst that, is in a galaxy billions of light years away from us. Did it just happen? Is that basically what he's saying? Like it? No, it, I think I think what he's saying is that because the because the laws are locally conserved, you can't. You have to use your perspective to yeah to make any sense out of it. Right. You can't say, well, that person saw them happen at different times. Right. Yeah. So let me work from that angle because you're not there and moving and whatever. You oh, okay. I mean? Yeah. Okay. You have to figure it out from your perspective. Yeah. Because that's what's the, the, the laws are conserved locally. Yeah. Yep. He just, he says, if you think two things occur at the same time, that's just like your opinion. Yeah. Man. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Someone else could conclude that of those events, one was before the other. Right. <laughs> It's just your opinion, man. <laughs> there is no reason why we should expect things to be otherwise, because the things of everyday experience involve large numbers of particles or involve things moving very slowly or involve other conditions that are special and represent, in fact, a limited experience with nature. It is a small section only of natural phenomena that one gets from direct experience. It is only through refined measurements and careful experimentation that we can have a wider vision. And then we see unexpected things. We see things that are far from what we would guess, far from what could have, we could have imagined. Our imagination is stretched to the utmost, not as in fiction to imagine things which are not really there, but just to comprehend those things which are there. It is this kind of situation that I want to discuss. So let us start with the history of light. At first, light was assumed to behave very much like a shower of particles like rain or like bullets from a gun. Then with further research, it was clear that this was not right and that the light actually behaved like waves, like water waves, for instance. Then in the 20th century, on further research, it appeared again that light actually behaved in many ways like particles. In the photoelectric effect, you could count these particles, and they are called photons now. Electrons, when they were first discovered, behaved exactly like particles or bullets, very simply. Further research showed from electron, electron diffraction experiments, for example, that they behaved like waves. As time went on, there was a growing confusion about how these things really behaved. Are they waves or particles? Particles or waves? Everything looked like both. This growing confusion was resolved in 1925 or 1926 with the advent of the correct equations for quantum mechanics. Now we know how the electrons and light behave. But what can I call it? If I say they behave like particles, I give the wrong impression. Also, if I say... Also, if I say they behave like waves, they behave in their own way, which technically could be called a quantum mechanical way. They, beha they behave in a way that is like nothing that you have ever seen before. Your experience with things that you have seen before is incomplete. The behavior of things on a very tiny scale is simply different. An atom does not behave like a weight hanging on a string and oscillating, nor does it behave like a miniature representation of the solar system with little planets going around in orbits, nor does it appear to be somewhat like a cloud or a fog or of some sort surrounding the nucleus. It behaves like nothing you have ever seen before. There is one simplification, at least. Electrons behave in this respect in exactly the same way as photons. They are both screwy, but exactly in the same way. 
How they behave, therefore, takes a great deal of imagination to appreciate because we are going to describe something which is different from anything you know about. In that respect, at least, this is perhaps the most difficult lecture of the series in the sense that it is abstract, in the sense that it is not close to experience. I cannot avoid that. Were I to give a series of lectures on the character of physical law and to leave out from this series the description of the actual behavior of particles on a small scale, I would certainly not be doing the job. This thing is completely characteristic of all of the particles of nature and of a universal character. So if you want to hear about the character of physical law, it is essential to talk about this particular aspect. It will be difficult, but the difficulty really is psychological and exists in the perpetual torment that results from your saying to yourself, but how can it be like that? <laughs> Which is a reflection of, uncontrolled but utterly, of an uncontrolled but utterly vain desire to see it in terms of something familiar. I will not describe it in terms of an analogy with something familiar. I will simply describe it. There was a time when the newspaper said that only 12 men understood the theory of relativity. I do not believe there was ever such a time. There might have been a time when only one guy did because he was the only guy who caught on before he wrote his paper. But after people, re people read the paper, a lot of people understood the theory of relativity in some way or another, certainly more than 12. On the other hand, I, can, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> So do not take the lecture too seriously, feeling that you really have to understand in terms of some model what I am going to describe. Just relax and enjoy it. I am going to tell you what nature behaves like. If you will simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful and entrancing thing. Do not keep saying to yourself, if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it be like that? <laughs> <laughs> because you will go down the drain into a blind alley from which nobody has yet escaped. <laughs> nobody knows how it can be like that. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. Just, just accept it. Yeah, don't. don't ask how can that be the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that he says no one understands quantum mechanics. Okay, <laughs> so then, let me describe to you the behavior of electrons or photons in their typical quantum mechanical way. I am going to do this by a mixture of analogy and contrast. If I made it pure analogy, we would fail. It must be by analogy and contrast with things which are familiar to you. So I make it by analogy and contrast, first to the behavior of particles, for which I will use bullets, and second to the behavior of waves, for which I will use water waves. What I am going to do is invent a particular experiment and first tell you what the situation would be in that experiment using particles, and then what you would expect to happen if waves were involved, and finally, what happens when there are actual electrons or photons in the system. I will take just this one experiment, which has des been designed to contain all of the mystery of quantum mechanics, to put you up against the paradoxes and mysteries and pe uh, peculiarities of nature 100%. Any other situation in quantum mechanics, it turns out, can always be explained by saying, you remember the case of the experiment with the two holes? It's the same thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about the experiment with the two holes. It does, not con it does contain the general mystery. I am avoiding nothing. I am bearing nature in her most elegant and difficult form. And so then there's a long explanation, which I'm not going to read, but it's this basically the, the double, double slit, slit experiment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the way he explains it obviously is very cool, but you just can't do it in audio. Um, but yeah, he starts out with, you know, let's look at what happens if you do this with lumps, like bullets. Uh, and then he says, this is what happens if you do it with waves. And he shows you how there's an interference, constructive and destructive. And then he just goes on to basically say that the electrons or photons appear to show up in lumps, but they also d display the the wave patterns of interference unless you try to look at them with other light in which case you destroy the interference and they and then they just look like bullets after that yeah they look like particles after that yeah and then he talks about like well let's you know let's let's weaken the amount of light because he's saying you put a very strong light in there and as the electron passes through the light it will affect it and you can see how the light's being affected and that allows you to see the electron but obviously that's messing with the electron so he talks about weakening the light and all that results in is you missing most of the electrons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then you don't see the ones that you're interested in because they're the ones doing the thing that you can't see. And the ones that you do see don't do the thing that you're interested in because you hit them with the light. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> 
So but, this is I, I the the thing I got from this because I I did, um, I've listened to a bunch of his audio books and um, him talking about this in various um, lectures or uh, even in his courses. Um, and the thing I got from it is just it's it's like. Uh, we've talked about it before, but the basic idea is that in order for us to make an observation, there has to be an interaction. Yeah. You can't, it's like you can't sense something like this. The act of sensing something is really literally reaching out and touching it. Right. With some something. Yeah. So when the thing is in a void and it's not having any interactions, it behaves one way. We can't know what that way is. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way we will be able to figure it out is by inference. Yeah. Right? So there's, there can be no direct observation of that, at least at this point. Right. With yeah. whatever, with, with the tools that we have. And I'm, I'm assuming... It has to interact with something for you to see it. I right. Mean, that's, yes. And so it's kind of, it goes... Uh, one of the th analogies I like is that um, <clears throat> the idea that you can't see... A blade of grass, really. You can't, you're not really seeing what the blade of grass is or what it looks like, right? In terms of light. Yeah. Because you're only seeing the, the light that's being reflected off of it. Yeah. So like what it is, is absorbing. It's, it's almost as though it is more like the light that it absorbs. Right. Because that is the light that it is, it's in tune with. Yeah. Yeah, and the what light you're, that what you're seeing is the light it rejects. It's the, the light that is completely out of tune with and it's just <laughs> yeah. bouncing off the thing. It's right. like, nope, you don't fit. Mm -hmm. And so then we're like, ah, blade of grass. No. No. That's what it isn't. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of a, a cool analogy to me, but. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but it, he and he has a couple of other interesting ways to talk about this double slit thing where he's basically showing you the curves. Yes. Of what of what happens, and he's basically and he sort of shows you like here's what the curve looks like if it's if it's bullets, right? And then here's what the curve looks like if it's waves. And, you know, if you do the experiment where you're shooting bullets at the plate, and they're going through the slits, uh, and then you're measuring what's happening after they pass through the slits on the other side, then you get this particular kind of curve. And then you set up the experiment again where you're making waves. And the in a, curve is when you're graphing it out, like right? When you're you're yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're you're graphing out the responses that you're getting on the detector plate at the other end on the other side of the double slits. Then you do the same thing with water. You know, you've got something that's pulsing in the water so it's making waves and it's passing through and then it has to go those waves have to go through two holes and then the waves that come side through those side by side holes. Right. And then those two holes, you know, he first says it like let's make waves in a pool and then you've got some bar that's got two two holes cut in it so that the waves can pass through. And then you've got a detector at the other end of that. And he shows how, what happens if when you move the detector up and down or back and forth, farther and closer, and how these two things will change depending on what they are. But what's interesting is that he's basically saying, when you do this with electrons and photons, they arrive in, in units like a bullet but they make a pattern like a wave. They make the graph like a wave. That's how they're doing both things. I had never that had never been totally clear to me before. Yeah, it's like a that combination really cool. of both. Yeah, yeah, both graphs. Yeah. Isn't that right? No, no, it's not both graphs. The the, the it's that they arrive like they're singular lumps, unlike a wave, which is, a wave is basically a wave doesn't it doesn't have a have a lump. Yeah. Yeah. So they arrive in lumps, like a bullet, but they make a graph like a wave, which is why it's both things. That is not what I got from that. Oh, really? Well, maybe I completely misunderstood I thought he, it. I, I thought at the end, but see, I was listening to it. You were looking at all the diagrams and stuff. So you're probably right. I thought that the result was the combination of the, of the two different curves on the graph. Yeah, there's probably that too. I mean, he's got a table here where he shows bullets come in lumps. Uh, measure is probability of arrival, and there's no interference. Waves can have any size, so they don't come in lumps. They measure the what you're measuring is the intensity of the waves, 
and this shows interference. Electrons and photons come in lumps, but they show interference. And you're measuring the probability of their arrival, just like, so you see that the, the, what's being combined here. Yeah, so in the lumps, see, it's like, this is equal to N1 plus N2. Now we're getting into the weeds of this stuff. It right. like, doesn't make any sense, but. This is the same as this in terms of the graph. What's, what's different is what I'm saying. The electrons and photons, they show up in lumps, but they read on the graph like a wave. Yeah, okay. That's pr pr I'm pretty sure that's what he was trying to get at. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I believe you. I, I, <laughs> like I said, I wasn't looking at the graphs and, and carefully reading. I'm listening to it while it works. Yeah. So. But that was, that was really cool. And I was like, oh, okay, I see what he's saying here. That a wave, something with the, that, that shows up on the, when you graph it out, shows all the interference stuff and the and the and the basically the detection like a wave would which mm -hmm. it gives you a specific kind of curve that isn't the same as something that's coming in lumps and yet it comes in lumps yeah and so this is like, why which he's, slit did it go through right yeah <laughs> this is why he's saying you can't imagine how it's doing both of those things at the same time yeah but it does those things at the same time <laughs> <laughs> It it's, shows up in discrete units and yet acts like a wave. Yeah, that's weird. Until you try to figure out, when the, until you get curious and say, well, what is actually happening here? And then you start shining light at it to see what's going on. And then it stops acting like a wave and starts acting just like a regular bullet. Only lumps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so weird. <laughs> so that's the double slit experiment. What time are we at? Is it another break? Yeah, or are we... I mean, we're, yeah. We, we're going to have to do a short segment here. Oh, okay. We don't have to do it here, but we could do it at the end. Yeah, let's, let's do it here, I guess. Let's just stop here, and then I can finish off the chapter, and we can discuss it at the end All right. on the next segment. Well, we'll be right back then. Folks. All right, yeah. You might think that if you were clever enough, you could argue that they have some way of going around through the holes back and forth and they do something complicated or it splits in half and goes through the two holes and so forth in order to explain this phenomenon. But nobody, however, has succeeded to get uh, an explanation of this that's satisfactory because the mathematics in the end is so very simple, the curve is so very simple. I will summarize then by saying that electrons arrive in lumps like particles. But the probability of arrival, of arrival of these lumps is determined like the intensity of waves would be. And it is in this sense that the electron behaves, as you might say, sometimes like a particle and sometimes like a wave. It behaves in these two different ways at the same time. The Snake Bros Institute for Advanced uh, Particle Studies. <laughs> Where we have no idea what's going on, and I am not asking. You're not allowed to ask. I'm, <laughs> I am not asking in an angry manner. <laughs> Why do they act that way? <laughs> but uh, yes, this is the, the final segment here. Um, yep. What Prob else we got? Probability and uncertainty. So you got to hear there during the break uh, part of Feynman's discussion of the double the slit experiment. The ex yeah. double slit experiment is like really where he's trying to explain how they act in both ways. So he also says, I am not able here to discuss a large number of different ways which you might d suggest to find out which hole the electron goes through. <laughs> <laughs> like he's anticipating the students all coming up with ideas in their head. You could actually see this throughout the description of the experiment. He kept saying like, yeah, I know. You're all probably coming up with ideas right now of how you could do this. And trust me, we've tried them. <laughs> He says, it always turns out, however, that it is impossible to arrange the light in any way so that you can tell through which hole the thing is going without disturbing the pattern of arrival of the electrons, without destroying the interference. Not only light, but anything else, whatever you use, in principle, it is impossible to do it. You can, if you want, invent many ways to tell which hole the electron is going through, 
and then it turns out that it is going through one or the other. But if you try to make that instrument so that at the same time it does not disturb the motion of the electron, then what happens is you can no longer tell which hole it goes through and you get the complicated result again. That's what I think, yeah, that's what I would think of as like when you look, it shows up in lumps. When you don't look, it shows up as a wave basically is what it is like, right? Um, Are you thinking it's more, it's something else? M maybe you're right. I, I really got the impression that it, it's always in, that's why he's saying click, click, click. It doesn't matter how many holes you have open. Mm -hmm. It's showing up as a discrete lump. And if you turn the intensity down, it just, the lumps show up less often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But it still produces the it's wave still, pattern. But it, it produces the wave pattern. It's the wave pattern you destroy when you turn on your detector. That's what I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right. But and they still show up in lumps. Right. Then it shows up as the simple in one plus in two. That's lump right. Pat lump yeah. pattern. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. So he says, "Sorry, we've been. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're still talking past each other <laughs> on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he says Heisenberg noticed when he discovered the laws of quantum mechanics that the new laws of nature that he had discovered could only be consistent if there were some basic limitation to our exp experimental abilities that had not been previously recognized. In other words, you cannot experimentally be as delicate as you wish." Heisenberg proposed his uncertainty principle, which, stated in terms of our own experiment, is the following. He stated it in another way, but they are exactly equivalent, and you can get from one to the other. So he stated, so the statement is, it is impossible to design any apparatus whatsoever to determine through which hole the electron passes that will not at the same time disturb the electron enough to destroy the interference pattern. No one has found a way around this, and I'm sure you are itching with inventions of methods of detecting which hole the electron went through. But if each one of them is analyzed carefully, you will find out that there is something the matter with it. You may think you could do it without disturbing the electron, but it turns out there is always something the matter. And you can always account for the difference in the patterns by the disturbance of the instruments used to determine through which hole the electron comes. Mm-hmm. This is a basic characteristic of nature and tells us something about everything. If a new particle is found tomorrow, the kaon, actually the kaon has already been found, but to give it a name, let us call it that. And I use kaons to interact with electrons to determine the hole, to determine which hole the electron is going through. I already know ahead of time enough about the behavior of a new particle to say that it cannot be of such a type that I could tell through which hole the electron would go without at the same time producing a disturbance on the electron and thus changing the pattern from interference to no interference. The uncertainty principle can therefore be used as a general principle to guess ahead at many of the characteristics of unknown objects. They are limited in their likely character. That's another, I, I just found this interesting also when I was reading through here is that the detector is interfering with the electron and that results in no interference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a confusing thing. You remove the interference pattern by interfering. Yeah. So he says, let us return to our proposition A. Electrons must go either through one hole or the other. Is this true or not? Physicists have a way of avoiding the pitfalls which exist. They make their rules of thinking as follows. If you have an apparatus which is capable of telling which hole the electron goes through, and you can have such an apparatus, then you can say that it either goes through one hole or the other. It does. It is always going to go, it is always going through one hole or the other when you look. But when you have no apparatus to determine through which hole the thing goes, then you cannot say that it either goes through one hole or the other. I mean, you can always say it, provided you stop thinking immediately and make no deductions from it. But physicists prefer not to say it rather than to stop thinking. To conclude that it goes either through one hole or the other when you are not looking is to produce an error in prediction. That is the logical tightrope on which we have to walk if we wish to interpret nature. So I think he's just trying to stress that you, uh, he's go we're going back now to how we think of things working. And he's saying that in this case, you want to predict that it's going through either that hole or this one because it is showing up in discrete lumps. 
And he, what he's saying is that physics because it's coming out of the gun in discrete lumps. Yeah, I mean it's it's also arriving on the detector, the uh, you know at the other end of the hole in discrete lumps. Okay. So he's basically saying you want to say that it goes through one hole or the other, and he's saying if you build an apparatus to look, then you can say that, because that's what's happening. But if you don't, physicists have had to learn to not say that. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, to take that expectation out of their biases. Right. And that's hard because there is not really a good explanation of how this is working. Mm -hmm. Okay. This proposition that I am talking about is general. It is not just for two holes, but it is a general proposition which, which can be stated this way. The probability of any event in an ideal experiment that is just an experiment in which everything is specified as well as it can be, is the square of something, which in this case I have called A, the probability amplitude. When an event can occur in several alternative ways, the probability amplitude, a, this A number, is the sum of the A's for each of the various alternatives. If an experiment is performed which is capable of determining which alternative is taken, the probability of the event is changed, it is then the sum of the probabilities for each alternative. That is, you lose the interference. The question now is, how does it really work? What machinery is actually producing this thing? Nobody knows any machinery. Nobody can give you a deeper explanation of this phenomenon than I have given. That is, a description of it. They can give you a wider explanation in the sense that they can do more examples to show how it is impossible to tell which hole the electron goes through and not at the same time destroy the interference pattern. They can give a wider class of experiments that, than just the two-slit ex interference experiment, but that is just repeating the same thing to drive it in. It is not any deeper. It is only wider. The mathematics can be made more precise. You can mention that they are complex numbers instead of real numbers and a couple of other minor points which have nothing to do with the main idea. But the deep mystery is what I have described and no one can go any deeper today. What we have calculated so far is the probability of arrival of an electron. The question is whether there is any way to determine where an individual electron actually arrives. Of course, we are not averse to using the theory of probability, that is, calculating odds, when a situation is very complicated. We throw up dice into the air, and with the various resistances and atoms and all of the complicated business, we are perfectly willing to allow that we do not know enough details to make a definite prediction. So we calculate the odds that the, th that the thing will come this way or that way. But here, what we are proposing, is it not, is that there is probability all the way back, that in the fundamental laws of physics, there are odds. Suppose that I have an experiment so set up that with the light out, I get the interference situation. Then I say that even with the light on, I cannot predict through which hole the electron will go. I only know that each time I look, it will be one hole or the other. There is no way to predict ahead of time which hole it will be. The future, in other words, is unpredictable. It is impossible to predict in any way from any information ahead of time through which hole the thing will go or which hole it will be seen behind. That means that physics has, in a way, given up if the original purpose was, and everybody thought it was, to know enough so that given the circumstances, we can predict what will happen next. Here are the circumstances. Electron source, strong light source, tungsten plate with two holes. Tell me. Behind which hole shall I see the electron? One theory is that the reason you cannot tell through which hole you are going to see the electron is that it is determined by some very complicated things back at the source. It has internal wheel, wheels, internal gears, and so forth to determine which hole it goes through. It is a 50-50 probability because, like dice, it is set at random. Physics is incomplete, and if we get a complete enough physics, then we shall be able to predict through which hole it goes. This is called the hidden variable theory. That theory cannot be true. It is not due to a lack of detailed knowledge that we cannot make a prediction. Hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's interesting. Here he's dry, I think he's he's actually he's focusing on a different part of the same experiment. Now we've moved on from 
look how weird weird it is that it appears to be, both be discrete lumps and also like a wave. And now he's saying, even when you're checking with your light that destroys the interference pattern, you still don't know which hole it's going to go through. You have to look. Right. There's no way to know which hole it's going to pass through beforehand. Yeah. The hidden variable theory is that, well, there's something complicated happening at the source. And if we knew all those complicated things happening at the source, then we could tell you, you know, which hole it was going to go through. And he's saying that that, in, at least in his opinion, isn't the case. That yeah. the odds, the 50-50 odds, are built into the way the stuff works. Right. So when I was reading that, I just started thinking of like, you know, this is, is this part, this, this is like, could there be something philosophically interesting here about odds, you know, and gambling, like they're like how, how this can really grab onto people. It's actually a fundamental thing of the universe. <laughs> the universe does it all the time, <laughs> rolling the dice. Right. And this is why, you know, the, the famous and maybe a quote that didn't happen, the thing that Einstein was supposed to have said, you know, God doesn't play dice with the, with the universe. <laughs> he doesn't like this idea that hey, all the way down at the fundamental level, you're still rolling some dice. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. I, f I think he's also, like basically what I got from it is that he's also pointing out that it's, to me, I just see it in that way I've already described, which is the the idea of you because we're we have to use physics. <clears throat> we have to use what the universe built out of this system in order to look at it. Yeah, yeah. So it just interrupts it. So the I the thing is is that is inescapable. Right. You can't. You just, it's it's like this has become a principle that when when you use any type of sensor to sense anything, it changes its initial state. Yeah, and so therefore you can't know what the initial state was. Right, that's kind of the way way I think of it. But yeah, you can I, only I see know an, an initial state by inference. From you can say, well, I have all this detailed knowledge about what my sensor is going to do to it. So if I, if I use my sensor to measure what it's doing at the time that my sensor hits it, then I can maybe work backwards from there to infer its initial state. Yeah. Right? But yeah. you don't know. Right? Yeah, you can't ever really know. Right. That's the and uncertainty. And I think Feynman's just pointing out that like even with the sensor, this two-slit thing is actually showing you that you, don't, you can't predict which hole right. it's going to pass through <laughs> right. because there's uncertainty. Right. Yeah, it's cool. And uh, maddening in a way. You know, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, 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 the universe has always given us these things that are just bothering. <laughs> you know, yeah. people just like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like laughing. It's, it's like, wait, wait till they get all the way down there and find out. You can't yeah, find out. The, the universe has been, you know, <laughs> sending disgruntled people into their basements to do fucking research <laughs> since the beginning of time. That's right. <laughs> it's just, God, why is it doing this? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really key. He says, it is not due to a lack of detailed knowledge right. that we cannot make a prediction. Yeah. This is the whole thing with the uncertainty principle. And I think that doesn't Sean Carroll constantly reference this, the whole collapse of the wave? He basically is saying this is Heisenberg's thing. And, you know, it, that all, all stuff follows this mm -hmm. basic, these basic equations. Okay, so Feynman says, I said that if I did not turn on the light, I should get the interference pattern. If I have a circumstance in which I get the interference pattern, then it is impossible to analyze it in terms of saying it goes through hole one or hole two, because that interference curve is so simple, mathematically, a completely different thing from the contribution of the two other curves as probabilities. If it had been possible for us to determine through which hole the electron was going to go if we had the light on, then whether we had the light on or off is nothing to do with it. 
whatever gears there are at the source, which we observed, <laughs> and which permitted us to tell whether the thing was going to go through one or two, we could have observed with the light off. And therefore, right. we could have told with the light off through which hole the, each electron was going to That's go. Right. But if we do this, the resulting curve would have to be represented as the sum of those that go through hole one right. and those that go through hole two, and it is not. It must then be impossible to have any information ahead of time about which hole the electron is going to go through, whether the light is on or off, in any circumstance when the experiment is set up so that it can produce the interference with the light off. That's it is great. not our ignorance of the internal gears of the internal complications that makes nature appear to have probability in it. It seems to be somehow intrinsic. Someone has said it this way. Nature herself does not even know which way the electron is going to go. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that makes sense right there. This is a little... Yeah. Going through the logic of that. <clears throat> a philosopher once said, It is necessary for the very existence of science that the same conditions always produce the same results. <laughs> well, they do not. <laughs> You set up the circumstances with the same conditions every time, and you cannot predict behind which hole you will see the electron. And yet science goes on in spite of this, although the same conditions do not always produce the same results. And that makes us unhappy, that we cannot predict exactly what will happen. Incidentally, you could think up a circumstance in which it is, in which it is very dangerous and serious, and man must know, and still you cannot predict. For instance, we could cook up, and we'd better not, but we could, a scheme by which we set up a photo cell and one electron to go through, and if we see it behind hole number one, we set off the atomic bomb and start World War III, whereas if we see it behind hole number two, we make peace feelers and delay the war a little longer. Then the future of man would be dependent on something which no amount of science can predict. The future is unpredictable. So that is like the... Uh, what is this called? There's a... I've read about this before. I can't remember the name of it, but the idea of... This is like the cat thing. Yeah, yeah. Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. It's still alive. Right. <laughs> and also dead. <laughs> <laughs> what is necessary for the very existence of science and what the characteristics of nature are are not to be determined by pompous preconditions. They are determined always by the material with which we work, by nature herself. I think, I think, I'm uh, sorry, Schrodinger's cat just, he knocked the detector off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> well, my lab exploded. <laughs> I think my cat knocked the detector off the shelf. The lab's completely destroyed. I'm not sure if the cat is alive or dead. <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> So we look, and we see what we find, and we cannot say ahead of time successfully what it is going to look like. The most reasonable possibilities often turn out not to be the situation. If science is to progress, what we need is the ability to experiment, honesty in reporting results. The results must be reported without somebody saying what they would like the results to have been. And finally, an important thing, the intelligence to interpret the results. An important point about this intelligence is that, there, that it should not be sure ahead of time what must be. It can be prejudiced and say, that is very unlikely. I don't like that. Prejudice is different from absolute certainty. I do not mean absolute prejudice, just bias. As long as you are only biased, it does not make any difference, because if your bias is wrong, a perpetual accumulation of experiments will perpetually annoy you until they cannot be disregarded any longer. They can only be disregarded if you are absolutely sure ahead of time of some precondition that science has to have. In fact, it is necessary for the very existence of science that minds exist which do not allow that nature must satisfy some preconceived conditions like those of our philosopher. Yes. <clears throat> That's interesting. I love how he's like, well, you can be biased. But if you're biased, then a continuous string of experiments that show your bias is wrong is just going to keep annoying you until you figure it out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Hopefully that's what happens. Yeah. Unless you're completely convinced that you're right. Right. That's, that's not really a bias. Yeah. It's that's a little was, bit. That's what he was saying. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a preconceived 
notion of your correctness or whatever, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be, that's what he said. Yep. These Good stuff. Experiments like that can only be disregarded if you are absolutely sure ahead of time. Absolutely sure ahead of time of some precondition that science must have. Yeah. Yep. yep. Great stuff. I, I love that, man. Yeah. I love that that, I mean, I don't know. I just think it's really interesting that there may, that this uncertainty may just be built in at the very most basic level of the universe. That not even the machinery of the universe knows what it's going to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> I never thought of it that way either. Yeah, because that basically means that there's, there is no possible way to predict it. The universe has a certificate of ignorance. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and you can, you can wonder if that implies, I mean, like, is that what's necessary for things like, you know, the, the future can be changed? Like that there is, that, in other words, it isn't deterministic. Right. It can't be. So I wonder if that means that um, the laws can change. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. But I was also thinking of it in terms of free will. Does can that apply to? That's like a, I know that's, that's way, like way up in the way hierarchy. up the hierarchy. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it, the fact that at the fundamental level, the future is uncertain, even with movements of little particles. Yeah, we need to go. We need to work our way all the way through all the different <laughs> levels of the hierarchy to figure out if that's true. Okay. <laughs> so let's start out with with will. And work our way down until we get to the uh, to the double slit experiment and see if we're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I was thinking too in the like the idea of um, things not interacting, right? Like like I don't know for so, I, I, this is going to be hard to explain, but I was just thinking of the. Uh, the idea that there's a whole aspect of the universe that we just completely don't have any interaction with. So it's simultaneously, you know, they're, they're existing together, but then on some fundamental level somewhere, there can be by chance interaction, which could result in the weird uh, paranormal phenomena mm. in some cases. Extremely unlikely interactions yeah. between particles or aspects of physics that are just like out of tune with what we normally see almost all the time when yeah. we look with our instruments, right? Right. So it's like maybe that's part, maybe that's an explanation for so much of the weird stuff and then yeah. like you know our we're our bodies our brains our consciousnesses are so far up in the hierarchy not of philosophy but just the hierarchy of these of, of these, these interactions interactions yeah. coming together to create these more and more complex things that some people sometimes uh are sensitive to these yeah whole other universes that are just right here right that we normally have zero interaction with yes and it's it's also interesting you know that like could, could it be that a single interaction of that kind of the rare kind an outlier actually will 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 tune you in a way yeah to yeah. where they they begin to happen around you more often <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Or there's like a cascading effect or something. Yeah. 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 It's just, it, it really is like, I mean, like when you think about these things, when they're, they, they just talk about like getting down on these, you know, on the quantum level, how much space there is between everything. Yeah. Right. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and I think so. So, are what you are are is what you're talking about when you say there are all there's this, or this is what I got out of it. It seemed to be that you were saying like there's this whole section of the fundamental universe that you can't interact with. Are you talking about because because it's making these? It's at this quantum level. Is that what you mean? Uh, that's kind of what I was. What it was making me think of is that is that 
the the randomness or the odds, right? We're looking at one thing and saying, well, it's 50-50. It goes through one hole or the other. Yeah. And then you can't... It, the, the, the fact that that particle interacts with some other aspect of physics changes it yeah. forever. Right. right. So you can't actually interact with the particle doing its own thing. Yeah. So just yeah. that idea that that something not interacting with anything in the world of physics can just be everywhere because there's so much space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you could have a whole set of those that can interact with each other, but not I our see. set of I stuff. See. And it's all in there. Yeah, I see. And so occasionally, <laughs> because of the randomness or the, you know, whatever that, the principle of the uncertainty that there just sometimes yeah. is an interaction that causes maybe a cascading event and something, <clears throat> an apparition. I get it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's that there, what I was that there's, that there's a, an enormous number of these things happening all the time. These interactions, not not necessarily like paranormal things, but just down at the fundamental level, there's, you have a whole set of things taking place that uh, on, when they're finally interacted with, they completely become something different. So that you have basically this entire other universe down there <laughs> yes. of stuff doing things that don't make any sense to the way our stuff interacts with it, with itself. Yeah, that's a cool way. Of <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And then, yeah, if, if something takes place on the randomness, then it can it can climb the hierarchy. Yeah. Staying weird. Yeah. All the exactly. way to the top. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <clears throat> All right. So I think that that uh, next week will be the last one and it will be we'll just do the final lecture seeking new laws. All right. Sounds good, man. Yeah. Which I marked almost everything in it because it was so good. <laughs> shh, shh. Yeah, so. Uh, let me check. Um, see what's going on here. Oh, and I will be, um, I'll just tell everybody this too. I'm getting eye surgery in a couple of days. I'll be getting LASIK. So hopefully I will no longer be blind. Because yeah. right now I am legally blind without corrective lenses. <laughs> I have been most of my life. But yeah, they did the test and it's like, you know, what, have you had your vision checked before? Yeah. I mean, long time ago. Yeah. Are you basically 2020? Yeah. Right. So I'm like 20. I mean, I don't know if I still am. Right. I'm 20, like 2400 or 2600. Oh my God. So what, something you can read from 2600 feet away. I have to be 20 feet <laughs> from it to read it. <laughs> so i'm getting that fixed so if the the world ends i don't have to like be really careful not to break my glasses yeah it's important. <laughs> and you need to be able to see those pyramids right really well that's right i'm looking forward to it man yeah it should be great new <laughs> should be great <laughs> All right, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the serpent.com. All the podcast related stuff is there. You can also support us if, uh, you know, we do value for value. So if the podcast gives you any value, you can return value to us through Patreon or PayPal. And also, if you join the Patreon, you do get special content. So there is, there is a little tweak to the value for value model there. Oh, yeah. Thanks to everybody who has donated. We yes. really appreciate it. It's, uh, we offer the um, associate executive producerships and executive producerships uh, for donations 50 to 100 and then 100 and above. We really appreciate those. And then also all of the, all the way down to the smallest donations, their sustaining donations just keeping us going. It's great. We really appreciate it. So Right. Every, and if you any, don't, if you, anything you can, you can do is, is totally 100% oh, yeah. appreciated. Absolutely appreciate it. And if you donate to the PayPal and you leave a comment, we'll read it on the show. That's right. So appreciate all of that. Uh, yeah. Other stuff you can find on the website. You can join the Discord from there. Discord's a huge community of people talking about snaky subjects. So uh, check that out. If you want to find like-minded people, you can find them on the internet and also doing meetups I think some people just went to the British Museum 
So you can arrange meetups through the Discord with fellow snakes that are nearby. And uh, anything else? Yes. The YouTube video uh, Archer showed me is called The Other End of a Black Hole ah. with James Beecham. B-E-A-C-H-A-M. Uh, I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but uh, it's what I did watch sounded pretty cool. Okay. That was the, the whole black hole thing. Like yeah, all, yeah. the entire universe is oh, a right. black hole. Yeah. So yeah, if cool. you want, anybody wants to check I could it probably out. stick that in the show notes. All right. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Yeah. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Now we know how the particles, how the electrons and how light behave. They behave in a way that is like nothing that you have ever seen before. Your experience with things that you have seen before is inadequate, is incomplete. The behavior of things on a very tiny scale is simply different. They do not behave just like particles. They do not behave just like waves. Atoms do not behave like weights hanging on a spring and oscillating. Nor do they behave like miniature representations of the solar system with little planets going around in orbit. Nor does it appear to be somewhat like a cloud or fog of some sort surrounding the nucleus. It behaves like nothing that you've seen before.